We're live. Okay, we are live. Ladies and gentlemen and variations thereof, welcome to the Elder Scrolls Lorecast, a casual Elder Scrolls podcast. Excuse me, it's the Selectives Lorecast. And a casual Elder Scrolls podcast. Casual because we're not trying too hard to get this right. <laughs> Uh, my name is Chris Nelson, probably better known as Rotten Deadite. With me today are... I'm uh, Corey, also known as Gwenthrian on Reddit. A um, pleasure. I'm Audrey. That's, that's it. My name is Luther, better known as Darcius. And today, I believe we're talking about gods. We're talking about what constitutes a god, how do you get to be a god, what do you do once you're a god, and what are the gods that exist... Currently, what are they doing? And and then, <laughs> and then and then whatever else that comes to mind, as is, you know, as as you do. Um, and probably the first place we need to start is what what in the uh, when you call when you talk about a god in the Elder Scrolls universe, what is it exactly that you're talking about? And unfortunately, that answer is not incredibly easy to come to because. Gods in the Elder Scrolls universe are notorious for being um, myriad and uh, many, face, many faceted. And uh, so, for example, can you consider? Let me ask. Let me throw this question out to you guys. Can you consider a Daedra a god? Yes. Okay. Why? Well, because I... it's a. Go ahead, Luther. Oh well, I I, I personally don't believe that. There are really any gods in the Elder Scrolls universe except for maybe the Amaranth, the godhead. Mm. But uh, that's because they're just they're spirits that have varying levels of power. Um, the Daedra have nearly infinite power, and they're immortal and all this stuff, so it's hard to say whether or not they're gods. I mean, some would not worship them as gods. Hello, Putnam. Matt. Hey, welcome to the call. We just went live. Yep, like seconds ago. Convenient. <laughs> Convenient, indeed. And we're talking about uh, what we were just discussing, whether or not you can consider Daedra to be gods. <laughs> well, that requires an awfully silly definition of gods not to include them or to include other things that aren't them. That are okay. So does everybody want to kind of talk about how we define a god in the Elder Scrolls universe? Oh uh, sure. So. Um, I, I think it would be honestly the same way that you would define a god anywhere is whatever somebody happens to believe in. Like people, people worship the Daedra. Okay, so the Daedra are gods to those people. Same thing with the divines. And if someone worships a tree, then that would be their god. You know, like the Argonians or, or the Bosma or whatever. Like, I think it just depends on what what the people in that universe want to focus on for their religion, and anything else is. Like irrelevant, pretty much. So uh, I think I have a uh, merithic disposition, or position, disposition maybe, and I'm going to say that a god in the Elder Scrolls universe is any being with will that was at convention, and okay, that. What that you, that so wait, would that include Daedra then? Yes, it would. Okay. But would that include Talos? Um, well, if it was rewritten into the dawn that Talos was at convention, I'd say yes. And, would that include Xarxes? Uh, yeah. Xarxes was there. Was he? Uh, maybe he wasn't. Because if, they, I, if I recall correctly. He was immortal at first, wasn't he? Well, uh, supposedly, according to the legend, yes. Well, I, uh, the thing was, he was Ariel's scribe, and you kind of got to ask yourself, how mortal could you be if you were the guy's secretary? Yeah, I you suppose. Know? And, like, mm. RK, RK apparently ascended to godhood as well. And well, it depends on It depends on the uh, myth you come from, yeah. Ariel, I think, well, also ascended. Let's talk about a little bit about the about what Altmer, what, what the Altmer and probably most Marish races believe as far as gods go. Which is that, um, that? Well, what they believe in, what uh, I, I, I'll put it to you this way: I think what I'm about to say is probably a safe bet as being true. 
in the Elder Scrolls universe, which is that the uh, which is that the Altmer are closest related to a race of beings that are directly descended from the Adra, the gods, or not even from the Adra. Let's just say the Atata. Just any given god in the universe uh, in in the Elder Scrolls universe, including Magnus and anybody else who isn't around anymore. Um, well, technically, out of all things on right, and so they used to be called the Elnafe. Right, a yeah. little fuzzy on that. Okay, and uh, and the uh, Altmer believe that they are direct descendants of the Elnafe, and that anything that isn't considered a mare or an elf or a derivative like the Dunmer or the Bosmer, Bosmer, whatever they're called, um, <laughs> are anything that isn't one of those is a mannish race like. Uh, the Cyrodiils or the uh, Nords, and therefore they are not descended from the Elnafe, and why that might be can be argued until you're blue in the face, but basically what it comes down to is the universe is... The, 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 basically what it comes down to is the uh, Tamriel is divided in half between people who are descended from gods and people who aren't. So People who are descended and those who were created. Right. And so the... Uh, yeah. Okay. All right. Let's go with that. So, the question is, if you are, uh, uh, if if the Altmer, well, okay, this of course this raises the argument: if the Altmer are in fact descended from gods, and it sure as heck looks like it, then do the Thalmor have an argument? And well, the, only the, if the answer the only is one. yes. But let's get into that. Let's get into that later. Let's not do that pile yet. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But, By the way, yeah. So, uh, so what we're talking about here is there are okay. So, so then, so now let's let's sort of discuss like uh, how when well, okay. Uh, the reason why I brought this up was because we were talking about Xarxes as a uh, as the scribe of Ariel. But it should be it's noteworthy to, to that. Just because he was a scribe doesn't mean he was a. That doesn't mean he was a mortal. It could mean he was also an Atada, like Ariel was. Um, well, a lesser subgradient of uh, whatever. Not, not a subgradient, just a lesser Atada. Okay. It's important to define your define define the, the liminal borders here of what what a subgradient is and what isn't. And if you if you're listening to this and you don't know what a subgradient is, then I'll try really hard to remember to talk about that in a few. Yeah. Minutes. Well, we'll get to it soon. I'll re I'll remember. I'll try. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I think your argument, uh, 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 Corey, about uh, anything that was present at the time of convention is yeah, and probably Atta. pretty solid. Yeah. yeah. That's, uh, but I proposed earlier that I would say that we could define a god as any entity that isn't that do that doesn't die or can't die. And I mentioned this because I want to make a, 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 a special little note here that I'm saying that that also disqualifies the Nereverine. Even though he is ageless, you can kill him. I know because I died a whole bunch of times in Morrowind. Well, that, <laughs> um, that brings up, like, does that mean you would discount um, Sigi as um, God when they were... Yes, I would. I would uh, well, now, uh, on one hand, I would and I wouldn't, because um, you can kill Vivek, and Vivek talks about how he has, in the game, he talks about how he has died before, and that he kind of talks about it as though he sort of fell asleep and then eventually he got bored and woke up again. Um, and also, at one point or another, when you end up talking to him about the death of Amalexia and Sothisil, he kind of puts a little footnote in there and says something along the lines of, if you can even kill a god. So it's entirely possible that Vivek and the rest of Omsavi have, in fact, managed to reach a point where they cannot be killed. And instead, what you do is you appear to kill them, and, and what actually happens is they transfer to a different sort of existence. And which then they reconstitute, cool. they reconstitute themselves eventually. I think this... Because uh, you have the Earthbones, right? Who are right. Uh, Elfany, who decided, well... Mundus kind of sucks, so we're going to put our kill ourselves and or put ourselves into a stasis that's pretty much death and make ourselves a law force. And 
<clears throat> and one of the one of these earth bones is called Ifri. He is the Bosmer, uh, the head deity in the Bosmer religion, and um, he is indeed an earth bone. So the question is: Are the earth bones gods? Are they dead? Which they're described as being often dead. And if they are indeed dead, are they gods? Because they're they're worshipped as gods. You know, so... Well, let me ask you this. Um, well, actually, first off, let me ask for clarification. You say that the, uh, the Aedra killed themselves because they were disappointed with Mundus? No, 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 no. No, the, the beings... We know of... Uh, the beings who created the mortal plane, led by Lorcan, and then Magnus as the architect, and then so many powerful at Atta gave pieces of themselves to create uh, the mortal plane. Um, it was volatile, and there was no law or um, stability or state. I, I don't want to say no stasis because it was in a it was in a static state of of chaos almost, but contained. And um, in order for things to remain in a in a singular form. For instance, I'm going to go off the Bosmer legends. Um, the Bosmer were shapeless, ever-changing, and then Ifri was like, well, I'm bored of this. I'm going to sacrifice myself, make a covenant with the Bosmer, and say, you follow my green pact, and you'll remain in one shape. And um, it is hinted at, not only in the Bosmeri religion, but in the Aldmeri the, the overarching Old Mary um, culture that there were many Elfony earth bones who went, well, there needs to be a law to govern this, so I'm going to sacrifice my essence to create that law force. And they literally become indistinguishable from it. So, does that clarify your question? Yeah, sure. Um, so when the, uh, so you're, but what you're proposing is that the Aedra are dead and inactive? Not, not, not dead. They're in a... The sleeping state. Kind of. They're in stasis. They're not exactly alive, but not, they're not dead either. Why well, uh, Um, Chris, you said that if they were considered gods, they wouldn't be able to die, right? Right. So... Do we take the the Aedra and Daedra book as not reliable? Because it says specifically that the Aedra can be killed because of their sacrifices. So if we go by that book, we would have to say the Aedra are gods because they can die. But if we don't That's... take it seriously, then it would be different. Well, yeah. what I'm suggesting is that I think the book is either misinformed or using a, a, a language that, like, poorly chosen wordage. Because uh, <coughs> I'll put it to you this way. If the Aedra are dead, then there's a lot of stuff that happens in Oblivion, the game, yeah. Yeah. that doesn't add up. <laughs> well, it's not. It doesn't say that they're dead. It says, it says, as part of the divine contract of creation, the Aedra can be killed. Witness Lorcan and the moons. So it doesn't say they're Lorcan's, dead. It just says they ex, can be ex, killed. Lorcan's not dead because he keeps popping up as Shezarines all the hell all over the place. Oh, uh, here, here's. Uh, no. I think what we what the mortals of the mundane plane call dead to the Ad right. Ad to the Adra is a misunderstanding that is a way for them to understand what their their condition is, or and, or possibly an oversimplification. Yeah. Or yeah, an, an extreme oversimplification of what their condition is, and um, like I think that segues kind of into what subgradiency is. You know. Okay. Um, because if if you're a being who gave up your essence to create a thing and then you're kind of dead, but you're still taking part in that thing and even fighting yourself on the world <laughs> against different maybe aspects of yourself. This is How the case with Shazar, yeah. Yeah. This is the case with Shazar and maybe even Akatosh. How does that happen? Um, well, let's let's talk a little bit about subgradients. First off, this uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think this was a term that first showed up in the love letter from the fifth era. 
Um, that sound right? I think it is. As far as I recall, I don't I don't recall anything that disputes that, so I'm going to go with your. If I'm wrong, please leave a comment in this comment section below. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, and uh, I'm so I'm going to nerd for just a second. Subgradients are a reference to a concept called um, uh, uh, a, a, a reference to a mathematical operation called a Fourier transform, which is used to extract uh, s uh, simplified or simpler waveforms from a master complex waveform. So, if you have, if you kind of env envision recording a, a r uh, making a recording of a room full of people talking. A Fourier transform could be used. Possibly, this might actually work. I don't. I don't know. But but as an example, it would be like using math to extract one person's voice or a group of people's voices from that big dick cacophony of of many voices. Um, the reason why this applies to the reason why subgradiency applies to the Arbus and to the Elder Scrolls is because the Arbus is what's called multidimensional. It uh, uh, all the uh, every layer of of reality external to Mundus is a uh, is a dimension, not a envelope, not an envelope. So, for example, uh, Oblivion does not encircle Mundus and Tamriel. Instead, it's just a higher dimension, which means that to go from Nern to Mundus, uh, for, excuse me, from Nern to Oblivion, doesn't mean that you actually uh, travel a distance, although, as it turns out, you can. Uh, but instead, what's happening is you're shifting in, you can, in fact, sh just shift in the same place that you're in, which is why the in Oblivion, for example, the Oblivion gates open up and they appear to be windows into another dimension. That's because that's exactly what they are. When you summon a Daedra uh, from Oblivion, he doesn't come falling down from the sky, he just appears because he's transversing dimensionally. Uh, so if that's hard enough to understand, then understand that there's another dimension above that, which is called the Aetherius. And the reason why these dimensions are important is because they relate to the way Fourier transforms can be used to extract uh, one piece of information from a complex set of information. So the outer... The, the uber dimension, the dimension on top, uh, is a theorius, and that contains, let's say, a set of information, like a big chunk of numbers. And then the, and then the dimension of oblivion is a subgradient or an extracted piece of data of a theorius. And then mundus, and within it nern, is another extracted piece of data from oblivion. So all of the entire universe, from Mundus up to Aetherius and back down again, is all coming from a single large set of data, which is what we call the Arbus. Uh, this, cool. relates to, uh, this relates a great deal to uh, 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 MRIs and, uh, and magnetic imaging, but I really don't want to go into that right now, <laughs> um, which is how I learned about it. But... Uh, when, so when we talk about a subgradient, what we mean is you have the Arbus and, by extension, the Aetherius. Well, well let's, let's start over. You have the Arbus, and then a subgradient of the Arbus is Aetherius. And then a subgradient, in other words, a calculation of Aetherius, is Oblivion. And then a subgradient of that is Mundus. And then a subgradient of that is Portal Death. And then a subgradient so of that is... Nern, uh, one game plan. Is that what you said? The subgradient of mortal death. God dang it. I just friggin... I, I forgot to read it this week. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, the, um, it's the amaranth. Oh, yeah. sorry. I they, was they kidding. They used those. a different term for it. Like, yeah. uh, what was the word? The state gradient echo of Mundus. Center. State gradient echo of Mundus Centrex. That's it. Yeah. Uh, untranslatable <laughs> Z. Z. That was it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, I wrote an article about this a long, long time ago in an almost another life. Um. So the uh. So when we talk about um. Whether or not something is a is a is a god, as in relation to an Atada. 
the Atata are the entities that live in Aetherius. So they are, by their very nature, a hypergradient of Mundus. And so when we talk about what happened when an, an Atata transformed itself into an Adra, we're talking about a mathematical computation here. We're talking about a subgradient, an Atata that intentionally subgradiates itself into a simplified being for, for the purposes of, of uh, creation. Okay. Yeah. So, so the date that's subgradient. That's subgradiency in a nutshell. <laughs> <laughs> and this can I want to be I kind of want to add this and I, you can dispute this if you want but it can be this kind of I want to say um, I want I look at it kind of like a life cycle in a in a circular sphere because um you can you can go down, you can go up. Uh, I lost my train of thought. Well, if, if you're talking about if if you're talking about Fourier transforms, you can calculate a subgradient of a set, but you can't recalculate back up again because that data is lost if you only possess the subgradient. You don't have the data necessary to calculate the master gradient. Um, All right. What? What I meant to say, uh, mm -hmm. going on that, is that, um, but that uh, I should say that I know of, but for all I know, some mathematician in Germany has already proved that wrong. So, <laughs> <laughs> what I wanted to say is that once you hit Amaranth, um, it starts all over again. So the oh, highest, yeah. Yeah. once mm -hmm. you hit uh, Amaranth, you're the highest gradient again, and then uh, that new dream would descend all the way down until a, a new uh, dreamer decides to make its own dream and or doesn't and so on and so forth and it's an infinite cycle um, I would really highly cycle. recommend if anybody feels like looking something up on Wikipedia while you're watching this I would highly recommend you look up the Gnostic concept of aeons A-E-O-N-S and uh, just read about that and it'll start to feel really familiar because, well, you know. it also reminds me of uh, Plato's uh, uh, theory of forms right. as well mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the different uh, the, the Lenorma and the yeah. um, matter. The soul, the other one. Yes. The intelligence and, and the one or the good. Right. Anyway, so, so for uh, are we in consensus that uh, the gods are beings that influence the mundane plane creation, and that we're that's, there at convention? Well, yeah, Aaron, I have to ask you: um, Would you? Would you include the Hist as gods or not? Because they're from. Um, well, there's a, there's a debate that the Hist are indeed earth bones, but they're really? different. Yes, there's. I mean, there's there's a book, a book, a singular one, okay. that says the Hist <laughs> that the Hist are earth bones, but I don't I don't particularly like that. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, and um. Most theory says that the hist actually came from outside the dream, or mm -hmm. outside the mundane plane, and were there always. And I don't remember who. I think it's Ordo Chorus. I think so, but I think Kirkbride at one point or another brought up the idea that the hist were, and Argonians were the closest you can get to aliens in the Elder Scrolls universe. I yeah, think it was yeah. Kirkbride, he mentioned that. I think it was him. He mentioned that they were um, refugees. The hist were. Yeah. Somebody he, said that. Different dream, right? That's that's right. what I thought. That's um, cool. I like that. I think yeah, the idea were... that the hist are earth bones is, is um kind of lazy, just because they're trees. So you can be like, well, yeah, they're yeah. fucking. Natural, Roots. so it just seems lazy to me. <laughs> yeah, it, exactly. You know, and stuff like that. There's the, I mean, you know, there's three theories I'm aware of. It's the Earthbone theory, which I don't like because it's, um, you know, boring. Um, and therefore wrong. <laughs> and therefore wrong. Uh, the second one is is that they're from outside the dream that they are, like, Anu's night. I, I'm throwing in conjecture from mine that they're Anu's nightmare of Padme. Uh, oh, manifest, I like that. which That's dope. I like which, that. That's a good which, one. Which, which, eh. And then there's another one that kind of Kirkbride uh, 
and I don't want to take any, anything he says out of context, but as I understood it, were from another um, Calpaic cycle that was close to this one that either reached land or not landfall, but reached the end of it, and they escaped it and went to a new one. Hmm. Well, also, I remember talking to either it was Ordo Corvus or it was uh, Pilaf that I was talking to. And he was talking about how they were from one of the twelve worlds. Uh, yeah, the, at the beginning. Of oh the, right. Yeah, the, they're, yeah, the tw- and whatever the twelve worlds are, you know, you can. Yeah, I'm not sure what exactly. They sound like they're failed uh, munduses, maybe. Yeah, yeah failed yeah. dreams but or something. As yeah. as the hiss as God, though. Getting back to the original question, I <clears throat> am going to have to say probably not. And not not because they can't be because but because they don't want to be because they hmm. they choose to bind themselves to they choose to bind themselves in a way of reality that isn't their I don't want to say they don't choose it but they don't make the law of it. Like all the other gods that you know aren't the Daedra, but even they comply. But all all the other gods as we think of them in the uh, manic um, cultures all created law, created creation. The Hist did not do mm-hmm. that that we know of. That we know of. They and as far as and not a not GM. Yeah, and as far as I know, they were not there at convention. They are not mentioned. Well, you know, a lot of things are not mentioned, but they don't. They don't seem as little as we know about his. Don't seem like someone that would show up at convention. That they just kind of showed up later and be like, "This is my crib now." You know, welcome to welcome to Black Marsh. Hmm. Yeah. Okay, that's a good one. Anyway, but the but it's a it's important to note that there's. If you haven't guessed already, those of you watching at home, there's a lot of debate oh, yeah, uh, about this kind of stuff. And um, I might al- I would just also kind of like to kiss Bethesda's ass a little bit about creating a universe where there are no cut and dry religions. No <laughs> one's right and wrong, you know? Yeah. Um, um, thing, before we switch too quickly, I want to point out about the hist on the kind of uncredited to them not being gods, that the Argonians don't refer to them as gods. Um, oh, have- they don't. A Shallow Pools is an Argonian poem which um, the writer says that these children surround them and call them their hist, which implies that they view the hist as a more of a, a paternal or, or you know, parental figure than as a, as a deity, which makes sense since they're so uniquely connected to them in that way, so that's that and everything else. But it, it doesn't seem like they revere them as gods, so no one else really has any reason to either. Yeah. They might be all, all, all I All I know... Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to talk over you. Go ahead, say again. Oh, they might be considered sacred. That's a possibility. I know yeah, that the Argonians... Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. They tend to have a lot of, uh, what was it, egg iconography or something like that, where they view the egg as cracking, and that's like a... I don't know exactly what that's supposed oh, to be. Oh, wait, are, are you talking about the Tsaisi there? The Tsaisi creation myth? Uh, maybe it's the creation myth. I thought it might have been like something like the scarab and the new man. That's what I was thinking oh. it might have been. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so the I scarab that transforms into the new man is a is a is probably a Dunbar concept, and I yeah. say that because it shows up in the thirty six lessons. So I, yeah. I don't want to say that it's necessarily a concept shared by other cultures, like the walking ways, by the way. Um, yeah, it's just I I don't think that they're gods because they don't they don't act like other gods. They don't do they don't uphold creation. They don't man they don't they don't put in I don't want to say that they don't enforce their will on creation cuz hi, I'm an Argonian, you know. Or, or they themselves might be considered cowards. It's hard to say really. I I don't know, but what I do know, what I do, what what I do know is that they have an association with Argonian souls. So they may be, you know, again, this is conjecture. This is not truth. That yet, um, 
<laughs> that they may actually be the um, dream sleeve manifest. What? Ooh. Okay. Okay. Back it up. Let's talk about it. <laughs> okay. So, why the hist would be the dream sleeve manifest is because the Argonians regard, you know, when they die, they return to the hist, their their souls. So we we can take two things from this: we, either that the Argonians are fragmentations, subgradients of the hist themselves, giving a biological, you know, body, or that somehow the Hist have a really unique connection to souls. So what they could be is a an aware form of the uh, dream sleeve. And for those who don't know what the dream sleeve is, it's where all the souls go to be recycled and redistributed. And as far as we know, uh, no, no souls are ever created or destroyed. They just are. So my theory is is that you know they could be a manifest form of the dream sleeve because of how they behave with souls. I mean, I but don't have any Also there um the the former could be true as well because especially in ESO if you do a lot of the quests there, the Argonians themselves have a very particular uh, relationship with the things around them that other people don't have. You do a lot of quests as a even heart pact where the Argonians can fuse with coral and can like explode into nature and just become part of the land. So um, they would definitely, yep. I think that lends a lot to if they're a part of the hist and the hist being so intimate with the nature around them, then that would really, that would kind of change the nature of, of everything if they're not just related to those souls, you know? It or could be a matter of lunar currency. As in, their souls go back to their to the hist because that's where their spiritual alignment goes. Just like Nords go to Sovngarde. Yeah, that's, that's true as well. Well, that would almost make them gods, wouldn't it? Yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Perhaps I don't know. You guys ever thought of that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, um, under pressure. Doom, 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 doom. Okay, so the uh, so let's talk about the elephant in the room. Okay. Uh, by which I mean the big brass god. Let's oh. talk about Talos. Um, oh, the other one. <laughs> uh, well, I, I, I'm going to suggest at some point or another, if I don't, then I apologize, but I'm going to suggest that Talos and Numidium are the same thing. But um, um, I would just... So, just so we know, we're coming up on an hour and 15 minutes, so yep. we could keep our tangents small. Uh, well, uh, uh, actually, we're on um, 40 45 minutes, minutes, I think. Yeah, 45, 45 minutes. minutes. Well, now we started at 7-7, seven, seven, so... Okay. Whatever. Uh, <laughs> so, whatever. Um, so, we've got... Uh, so, there's a lot of qu people who ask whether or not Talos is an actual god or not. And the reason why they ask this is because Talos is, to my knowledge, the only undisputed case of a human becoming something like a god. Um, and a lot of people are going to talk about Om Sivi, but uh, the important thing to remember is that there's a difference between an elf becoming a god and a man becoming a god. Yeah. Um, for for an elf to become a god, it sort of kind of makes sense. I mean, they're just going back to becoming what they were before uh, Mundus was created. But uh, for a man to become a god does not make sense in the sort of metaphysics of the Elder Scrolls universe. It's it should be impossible. Um, but Rob and Deadite. Yes. But Rob and Deadite. Sorry. Go ahead, Luther. Go ahead. Where did man spring forth from then? I mean... That's a fine goddamn about, argument. I couldn't tell you. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> well, everyone who was created on... Or everyone who cre was involved in Mundus created Mundus, right? And everyone... So the Adra Or the dead Adra or whatever you want to think they are, um, the Myrrh apparently sprang forth from them. Man, well, uh, the, I, I think the argument is that the Mare sprang forth from the Atata. And that the uh, oh. and that mankind was spawned from either from uh, the Adra or 
from, uh, I think, more likely, I think we're meant to believe that they were just some, some kind of a product of Mundus. Um, oh. Either way, the Altmer are pretty, the Altmer and most Marish religions are pretty insistent that the, that man is not, that the man races are not in any way, like, related in blood or whatever um, to gods. Well, what I was going to... Of any kind, really. Yeah. What I was going to say doesn't... earlier was, um, but Rotten Deadite, um, Talos was a Breton, therefore a man so wasn't he an elf? <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah, he was. So, I mean, he's, he's and then three different guys, right? And only one of them was a human. Yeah. Or a right. Or, and the, the second the one was an um, imperial. One was a Breton, I think. Oh, okay. Right. And anyway, and the second thing I was going to say was, uh, according to Cyrodiilic tradition, um, men were created by the gods, were given life by the gods. That they were, you know, the gods were you know, mommy daddy figures and said, Okay, be good children and have this earth and go forth and <clears throat> do do human shit. And according to the Merithic tradition, that humans were a part of the uh the wandering elfany, which were a group that apparently were not connected to Aldmeris, I think. Or when Aldmeris was destroyed they went off and did their thing, and everyone else was doing whatever. So, according to Merithic tradition, they are descendants from the wandering Elfany, and the elves from the, from the old Elfany. And then they had this kind of cataclysmic god wars thing, where it destroyed, almost destroyed the earth, or you know, almost I, destroyed Nern. Yeah, I think it's almost impossible I, for man to not. I, 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 yeah, exactly. I, I think it. Um, uh, we could be talking about um, like the sort of like the differences between an an Anuic and a Padomaic. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Origin, origin story, yeah. possibly. But also, I mean, uh, also really quick, I, if I recall correctly, the wars between the Elnofe were what formed the land on yeah, the land masses. Yeah, that's land masses on. Which, by the way, means that when Nern first formed, it was entirely water. Yep. Which means or, it was composed uh, entirely uh, of memory. memory. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. So, yeah, okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, uh, I don't care what Schick says. I freaking love that. <laughs> okay. Like, <laughs> yeah. He was like, well, you know, it was written by blah, 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 and, you know, it's only one person's approach. I'm like, yeah, screw you. It works too well. Um, <laughs> it explains why uh, there's not a, a god of the ocean. It does. Um, yeah, sure. Although, apparently, kirkbride has got an opinion about that, and I'm looking forward to hearing it. Yeah. Um, so, Today's the... Here. Yeah. So, there's a, uh, a lot of... Uh, a lot of arguments as to why men and... Elves aren't, as to why Talos can't be considered a god, but and and this is the this is and I would normally agree with it, like because but I mean after um, aside from Shazarines, after the uh, after Tiber Septim passes away, he doesn't ever show back up again, except he does show back up again in Coda, and if he hadn't shown up again in Coda, I would have been like kind of thinking, like, well, this pretty much seals the deal for me as far as Talos not being a god. But then he shows up, and now I'm like, well, hmm, I don't know anymore. Well, so, kind of so... Well, I... Well, I'm kind of, a lot of A lot of speculation that I make about the Elder Scrolls is what was going on in Kirkbride's head. It's really hard to separate those two things. Really. So, <laughs> I'm going to make that mistake a lot. What we can agree... Um, you know, what, I think, what, what I think we can agree is that Tiber Septim, Talos at some point achieved royalty, okay? And what that... Which is a walking way to divinity. Yeah, which is a walking way to divinity. And if you, you know, in, in my opinion, that Talos ascended by the fourth, and by ascending by the fourth, which is mantling, by taking the place of uh, what is presumably Lorcan. Um. Oh. Oh. Yeah. 
Yeah. He takes the place of Lorcan's heart. Yes. When he plugs <laughs> the, the when he plugs the uh, the Mantella into Numidia. Yeah. Yes. Right. And so pretty much what Talos is is he's a he's a he, he's his own entity, right? Is he's his own person, but he takes the place of another thing and becomes indistinguishable from it. And I don't know so essentially what we're asking right now is if we're going to say he's a we're going to go with because I don't really can't go that far into it because I maybe my understanding isn't there but if we're going to say Talos, Talos is indeed the replacement of the heart um and what the Thalmor are arguing is that, no, he is not the heart, and humans are saying, yeah, he is a heart, but he actually, you can't really tell the difference, because it's the same thing. You know? Right. Mm -hmm. so, in my opinion, is he a god? Yes, because he mm -hmm. walked walked the ways. I think he walked all, all of them. Uh, I don't know about did, that. He, but he certainly walked at least one. Yeah. Or minimum. Did, yeah, I think he did one, and then he did all the rest. <laughs> well, then you're gonna have to. You get to tell me what the other ones are. Well, the the, pro, the Prolex Tower. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's another thing is we don't know what all the walking ways are yet. Yet. But there are. There's a lot of theories. Um, for instance, uh, the Prolex Tower, which is probably my favorite ones because I don't know uh, Prolex, which is something about I don't remember the direct definition right now. It's something about talking. For a really long time, for no reason, right? It's, it's, it's right. what it's what we do all the time. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's lot, excessive wordiness. Yeah, excessive excessive wordiness. What I'm doing right now, because <laughs> because um, a lot of people think that you just sit around for a long time until suddenly you're a god, and that's a prolex. And I don't I don't necessarily agree with that. But yeah. and then there's a the second one, which is uh, by tower building. And or becoming a tower, which was a tower. <laughs> um, you know. Mm. <laughs> I don't know. Um, okay. At this point, I'm just rambling. Let's get back All on right. track. Is Talos yeah. a god? Is Talos a god? Well, okay. So what we're like basically the best. If you can't define specifically what a god is. And I think that's probably a good idea to not define specifically what a god is. Yeah. Then you can certainly argue that the probably the safest answer as to whether or not Talos is a god or not is he's about as close to a god as makes no difference. Um, and that's kind of one of the things that's sort of important to keep in mind about the Elder Scrolls universe is that if you if it looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, then you might as well call it a duck. If if you have an entity that is, in all functional ways, a god, and that's what it is, then it is a god. Um, so when Almsivi were at full-blown Power Rangers mode, uh, <laughs> after accessing the heart of Lorcan, when their power was full, they were every bit a god. Yeah, and but we're also a god by the Oasis. Right, and Vivek, exactly, and Vivek speaks at length about what it's like to become less of a god. But he doesn't really seem to talk about, he doesn't ever really seem to say that he isn't a god. You know what I mean? Yeah. He just says that he's just not as powerful as he used to be, and he sort of explains it in a way that I think is a lot like explaining the first few minute, the first few plank seconds of the Big Bang. Uh, you know, the first you know, sub-billionth sections of a second when the universe was created, when everything was one-dimensional and then suddenly expanded into four dimensions. Um, it's the, 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 uh, um, it's the, it's, it's sort of hard to explain unless you spend a lot of time reading books, but it's a change in perception without a change in physical uh, nature. Yeah. So I, I think that uh, 
Um, you could also argue things like, I, I think at one point or another somebody suggested a good safe bet was to say that a god is anything that would at one point or another existed as a higher higher gradient than Mundus. Or which, achieved a higher is, gradient. Which Yeah, it's a, it's a, that's pretty good. That's a pretty good cut and dry definition. Although it does, uh, although one thing we haven't talked about, and let's try and make this relatively quick because we're getting we're getting yeah, on, yeah. Um, is whether or not Daedra are gods or not. And well, we can go back and make the same arguments that we've already made again. But I think that it's relevant to take the approach of a book about the um, Dwemer, which was uh, Azura and the Rose, I think, Azura and the Flower, or something. Azura and the Box. And in Azura box. and the Box. That's it. And um, where it where it pretty cleanly suggests that Azura, whether the whether the story is true or not, is a, a whole other conversation. But uh, it suggests that Azura is not all knowing, which I'm apparently nervous. the Dunmer believed was a qualification for a god. That if you were a god, you would that Azura would not have made the mistake she made. Yeah, and but then, then but then she put something in the box, and then made them all confused. So, um, yeah. So I, I so I I don't know if this is the cut and dry answer that a lot of people are looking for, but I I, I you know if you're looking for clear answers in Elder Scrolls lore, you're going to have a bad time. <laughs> but we'll try. We'll try to we'll try to clarify it as best we can without confusing you, but absolutely confusing you. Uh, bye, Luther. I assume you'll be back. Um. So let's talk about this question that somebody asked on the yeah. uh, on the uh, uh, podcast. Yeah, we're gonna go into our Q and A section now. Where? Corey, do you want? I mean, uh, do you want to read this thing off? Um, What's this guy asking? So, uh, I, I, Eric, here's Did the name. It? I've still got it here. Ar Aramithius. Aramithius. I'm going to call you Aram Aramithius, and I'm probably pronouncing it wrong because I'm good at that. So uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Uh, butchering names like it's our business. So uh, we don't even know how to pronounce Chim. So <laughs> <laughs> Kime. It's pronounced Kime. Wait, it's obviously. it's Queen. <laughs> All right, so the question is, uh, thanks for this, guys. I've been looking forward to the next installment for ages. Glad this is likely to become more regular. Nope. <laughs> yeah. Nope. Yeah. <laughs> One thing that you left out was how or why the antiomorphs uh, need to involve three entities. So, at least according to the definition of the word, uh, involving two objects that mirror one another uh, this being the case, I don't get why test antiomorphs have to have three entities involved, particularly as Sermon 29 lists two as a number of the antiomorph. Could you clarify that, however, briefly? So, uh, brief, goes, briefly is a trick, but yeah. that's, that's uh, I can tell. That's basically a question uh, going through, like basically asking what is the role of the observer, like yeah. in general. Right. Yeah. Pretty much uh, because the observer, because all things appear to happen in threes, except when they don't, because <laughs> Tesla. The the uh, this this the the answer to this goes all the way back to what Elder Scrolls are. Yeah. Which is that Elder Scrolls are possibilities that are that don't happen unless a hero is there to fulfill them. And the hero in that relationship is the observer. And uh, once again, we're going to head straight into quantum theory hyper nerd stuff. Um, the enantiomorph is a particle wave function, which consists of, which basically positions, it, it, it suggests a number of outcomes. And in the case of uh, uh, the enantiomorph, by themselves, the uh, both sides of the enantiomorph form a superposition, not a static outcome. And the observer is necessary to, as Kirkbride puts it, collapse the waveform, uh, which basically gets this uh, the, all these possibilities to just friggin' make up their minds and do one particular thing. Um, if without the observer, an enantiomorph would never resolve. 
it, uh, 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 Anu and Padme without an observer would never produce anything. Um, and uh, uh, even near as the uh, as arguably as the observer would never um, uh, 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 who, who, who may or may not have been the observer uh, would not have been able to produce anything if she was not acting as the observer. Uh, what did she observe? Well, she observed the requisite betrayal, which is the other option, which is the other uh, frequently optional part of the uh, an anti-morph relationship. Um, uh, so, it, it, the the reason why the, the sermon two is called the anti-morph is because it's talking about the uh, is, is because it's talking about a pure an anti-morph, just two entities. But when you talk about why enantiomorphs come in threes, what you're actually talking about is the enantiomorphic event, the point in which the waveform collapses and you get a single outcome. That's as, that's as quick as I can put it. <laughs> uh, yeah. Harvest the musical? No, oh, wait, I'm skipping something. Okay. Um, how, did we, how did we become so knowledgeable? Yeah, how did we become so knowledgeable? So, uh, Audrey, you want to go first? Yeah, um... I wish that, that Pilaf were here because he has that his favorite quote ever from Elder Scrolls about reading a fucking book or whatever. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty much it. It's just like going through the games multiple times, reading all the dialogue, going to um, UESP, going to the Imperial Library, and reading all of the texts that are there. And then talking to people about it. I talked to um, Ordo Corvus and Pilaf extensively about things that I wasn't sure on or didn't quite understand. And that's... That's just it. It's just reading and talking to people, and just have to devote some time to sitting down with a lore and taking a look at it and asking questions if you don't know. Um, Chris, you want to go? Can't put it any better than that. I think that's exactly right. I, I, I would add. Actually, I would add. Um, read all as much lore as you can, and try to try to. Um, which an easy way to do that. I, I like the suggestion of uh, just read until something catches your mind, and then chase that trail. You know, yeah. if if uh, if if Numidium and giant stompy robots is your thing, then just read up as much as you can about that. If why where did the Dweamer go? If you want to learn about that, then read as much as you can about that, and you'll pick up stray bits here and there. And like as anybody will tell you, I could talk your ear off about uh Dwe about the Dunmer and most things Morrowind, but if you ask me a single question about Nords, I have no freaking clue. I'm completely <laughs> clueless about Nords. They um, like me, not even not magic. I understand it's cold, um, but <laughs> beyond that, I don't know. And uh, uh, you're never going to be able to learn everything. Um, if you're lucky, you'll be able to get like me, and you can just bullshit really well. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the uh, but when, when it comes to uh, when you're read while you're reading lore books, it's critically important that you Google everything because you're gonna read and come across a word that you don't understand that doesn't look like English. And like enantiomorph is a good example. Um, it just doesn't sound like a real word. And then you Google it, and now all of a sudden you're, on, you're getting wiki lost, which is the right way to do it. Um, it there's, it's, a, there's a browser like, like, called Google Dictionary. You double-click right. a word, and it'll give you the definition. It's very exactly. useful. It's, it's really good. Uh, that's, that's a... Um, if you just if you get confused about something and you can't seem to find a source in Elder Scrolls books, in in-game sources to ex explain it to you, and you don't quite feel like asking about it on a forum yet, then the fastest and easiest thing to do is just Google it. Nine times out of ten, you're going to end up with an explanation somewhere about it, and it may not even be an Elder Scrolls-related explanation. I'm sorry. Go ahead. What's important is, um, especially with a lot of um, Kirk Ride works that that aren't in the games, if you're, if you're going through and reading them, there are a lot of words in there that you won't see anywhere else, and you won't understand the reference, and that's totally fine. Um, one thing I always suggest to people, and I do when I, when I write lore stuff for them, is um, to start simple. If you want to learn about the tribunal, go and learn about the tribunal, and if, if like, metaphors and if the sermons confuse you, don't worry about it. Just try to learn as much as you can, and then you can pick through the really, really weird shit later. Because you really yeah. want to have a, the bare bones down before you get into the Crazy balls, space adventure type thing. <laughs> uh, yeah. Putnam, you wanna yeah. you wanna elaborate on your experience? How you became a lore buff? I don't remember. Uh, mostly, I guess I read a lot. Um, I, I really don't remember. I guess I read a lot. 
then I uh, talked with people. And then this, I think this might actually be kind of important. I explained to people who don't know anything but were interested. That's a great point, yeah. The best way to learn something is to teach it to somebody else. So I guess uh, the last remaining is me. Um, once upon a time, a prepubescent me was... And I came across a book that talked about Pelinol, and I was like, oh, wow, this guy's a badass. I decided uh, to find all the books I could in Oblivion about him as possible. And then with my friend, um, I got in an argument with him about uh, lore, and uh, ever since then, I've been a lore buff because arguments, <laughs> trying to teach it to other people, I suppose. That's, that's where the beards come from. Yeah. You know? And uh, from there, uh, I realized everything I knew was wrong, and <laughs> and uh, I read other stuff, I researched stuff, and blah, blah, blah. So uh, one thing I do want to kind of a piece of advice is that unless you're a, uh, a comparative religion major, you're probably not going to get all of it right away, and that's fine. And, yeah. Uh, if, if you're in college right now and there's a comparative religion course coming up and you're at all serious about Elder Scrolls lore, take it because it's a yeah. huge advantage. Huge. Yeah. One yeah. of the nice things is, um, the, what's the book, uh, Past the Sky's Rim? He's, um, that was oh, a yeah. Book. That yeah, was a book. right. You can look at, at a bunch of stuff. There was, um, I mean, it's heavily you know Christian influenced, but there's a lot of stuff on the tribunal and there's a lot of stuff on uh, the the Adra and the, the Nord Pantheon specifically. So. You can pick it up on Amazon.com, Past the Sky's Rim, and The Elder Scrolls and Theology. It's by Joshua Wise. It's very good. It's 15 bucks. Don't be a cheap ass. <laughs> There's a lot, of, a lot of guys who wrote the essays in there, guys that you, know, you might recognize from around um, the yep. official forums and, and Reddit and everything else. So it's pretty good. Too, pretty good. Anyway, uh, the last thing I want to add is just, just read the books. I mean, that's the lore in general. And then you can um, make inferences and opinions on it after that. And um, then you just go to forums, whatever forum you pres uh, whatever forum you uh, like best, and just have uh, interfaith dialogue with them. <laughs> and oh, exactly. Uh, and don't be afraid of online. Uh, yeah. It's got really good books. And so good. Some of them are really good stepping stones between like the basic stuff and like Morrowind's weirder lore, mm -hmm. and Oblivion's yeah. weirder lore for that matter. And don't and don't be afraid to be wrong, but at the same time, don't necessarily uh, just put down your argument just because someone else said so, you know. Right. And always, yeah. always verify your stuff in lore books. Because that is the most uh, tangible, I guess I'm going to say, lore that we have. Yeah, it, it's helpful to say, I mean, it, I, I don't know if this is strictly purely CODA compliant. But it's helpful to in, on forums to say, in my opinion, blah. Or I'm writing a story, or the way I played Morrowind, or the way I played Skyrim, or whatever, it's blah. Yeah, and yeah. To, but to just outright state, you know, uh, well, T. Perceptum was a uh, uh, was Doctor Who, um, <laughs> is is going to get you some That's weird good. looks. Um, uh, but it's uh, yeah, it, the the in in the Elder Scrolls lore community, it's there. There's a lot of people, including myself, who really love headcanon, which yeah. is, I mean, we, we we throw the term coda around a lot. It's it's a good term. But it, it it's it can be simplified. It, it's sim yeah. If you simplify the term, it's kind of like headcanon. But it's a uh, it's a really good concept. And the more comfortable you become with Elder Scrolls lore, the more obvious it becomes that Dakota is the way this is supposed to work. Yeah, it's you know. a really good term, but it's jargon, and it's not a very... When people, like, come in who are kind of new to all this and they ask, don't understand like, it. is everything... And then you just say, it's Coda, dude. They're like, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> one that, one, I, one, I think I mentioned this before, but um, one of the things that, that I noticed that we as a community interested in this is, uh, have a problem with is people getting um, feisty one way or the other. 
people who are only like strictly in, interested in the games and, and what happens in the games, and people who are interested in the games, and then the outer shell, which is the writings that don't appear in the game, is the writings that don't appear to interact with the books that you read in there. Um, so if you're interested in finding out about lore, you really want to be a lore buff, it's totally okay to pick one or the other. Just don't fight with people about it. That's yeah. all I ask. Cause it's, it's not helpful to be like, that wasn't in the game. It'd be like, why don't you appreciate this if it's written by fucking douche Lord McGillicuddy and he's he broke it on the phone with brain. It's awesome. Why don't you like this? Like, you yeah. kind of just be nice one way or the other. The sex way into the last thing I want to say is that um, she said that you have two pieces. I personally take both. And I can talk about both of them because I, you know, but uh, just remember, your experiences are not necessarily uh, any more or less valuable than anyone else's. And um, the way the way it happened for you did indeed happen, and the way it happened for someone else did indeed happen. It's it's I don't want to I don't know if I want to use this word, but it's canon, <laughs> you know. So yeah. Yeah, you know, Ar Aramithius also asked us um, what we consider to be the most difficult part of lore to deal with. Ooh. Uh, and I maintain that's fucking Talos, man. That that's just a that's a friggin' mire trying to explain that to people because Which one? Oh, I mean, T. Receptum in general. Yeah, all all of them. You know, I can I can explain I can explain Numidium. Um, and hopefully we'll do a cast about that sometime. Uh, and I can explain... I can't even really expl adequately, for my, for my, like, from my perspective, I, my explanations for who Talos was or is, is not, I don't know. I'm, I'm not satisfied with it. I, I, I think it could be, I think I could be better at doing that. Um, and, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that there's a lot of conflicting information from within the same friggin' documents. And um, and 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 things just don't add up. Uh, it, it, but does anybody else, what what else frustrates other people? Um, go ahead, Audrey. I get frustrated by um, there's a serious lack of interest it seems from a lot of people regarding uh, red cards. Um, I've never played <laughs> the best race. <laughs> I, like you guys laugh, but I'm serious. Like how many people do you know like? Play a red guard in their red in their games. Yeah, They're like serious, serious lore buffs might love them, but a lot yeah. of casual players don't play red guards, don't know a damn thing about them. I never played Daggerfall. I didn't do um the um what, what the fuck are they the other dudes who had the what the fuck is the faction in ESO? I can't remember. Uh, you know. Evan, the the no. Covenant. The, I didn't do the, yeah. the Covenant questline beyond the original thing. So you have a lot of people who don't play that race, don't know anything about that race, and so. You have very limited discussions on them. Well, they also so, have. Like, they have very limited lore that most of it came out do. during Red Guard, though. So. So it's old as fuck, and you don't have a lot of people who know about it. So it's very difficult for me to kind of be able to just easily reach in there and pull out a nugget of, you know. Yeah. Rad shit because well, it's just it's not really talked about that much. Hopefully that'll change if they decide to do a Hammerfell game, but I understand oh, that Kurtz is not really doing the hammer, not really talking about the next Elder Scrolls game, as he's dealing with a lot of Fallout right now. In her. <laughs> um, so, uh, and, and I agree that that's a, that that kind of sucks. I think more people need to talk about uh, uh, Red Guard. I don't think anybody needs to talk about Bretons because they suck. No, Bretons do not suck. Don't say that. No, Bretons are boring because nobody talks about them because there's nothing to talk about because they're boring. It's kind okay. of a terrible. One, one word. No, no, no. One word. All I have to say is you'll save horse tribes. And your, your your opinion is wrong. <laughs> I'd also like to add that trolling is an art. <laughs> <laughs> um, Don't make yeah. me have hinted here. Okay. Uh, Putnam? You want to still there? Oh, yeah. What drives uh, you crazy, man? Oh, not much. Uh, what was I thinking about earlier? Whenever I go on to the Bethesda lore forums, there's something that drives me crazy there, and it's usually something <laughs> different. Usually a 20-page topic on, is even canon, is that person? <laughs> <laughs> was are the Ekmer this? canon? Yeah, uh, oh, they're, they're so canon. <laughs> Ekmer are like a thousand percent canon, dude. <laughs> 
Um, for myself, um, I was always more interested in what each culture believed and what their day to day lives were and how they uh, interacted with each other. That's what really interested me. You know, uh, what they believed their gods were, what um, what they fought over, what they ate and drank. That's what I liked. And um, though I find it interesting, I really find metaphysics, just in general, to be challenging at times because um, I guess I don't have much background in things like that. And uh, sometimes, uh, like, when I first read through CODA, and this happened to a lot of people, but when I first read it, most of it went over my head. Yeah. Um, most of it went over my head, you know, um, just interpreting everything that was there, and there's a lot there. Um, and I find that most challenging for me. So, like when you're reading through certain lore books that are related to metaphysics or hint at metaphysics, such as, you know, the, the Song of Pelinal, um, or related to metaphysics, I should say. And uh, Language without action is dead witness. Yes. Um, it's just <laughs> interpreting that stuff, a lot of times it goes over my head, and I don't see... Um, the information that is there, and um, I guess just reading more and and critically thinking about it would fix that. But that's what's most challenging for me is critically analyzing metaphysics and what it means. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I got. I guess it goes back to the question we answered a little bit ago. And one of the reasons why I reached out and searched for the lore community was to help understanding what the hell's going on. And then I lurked, and then I wrote some stuff, and then now I'm here. Yeah, that's always that's always a, that's actually a really good suggestion. And if you if you've been lurking for a while and you have an idea, um, write it down. Um, even if it's wrong. Which, which, yeah, I even yeah, no, especially if it's wrong, because yeah. sometimes it can be wrong in the best possible way. Yeah, like know? I was. In it. Yeah, I was completely wrong, and people set me straight, and then. Well, as straight as you can be in the gray, maybe. <laughs> yeah. It's but, still pretty curvy. <laughs> yeah. But, um, yeah, so that's what I find challenging, and um, I imagine people have similar challenges. And all you just, you know, just reach out and think about it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, uh, I guess we can wrap it up, or we can rattle on for another hour, but let's not do that. Uh, hey, man. So I, I can. I think it's probably there's probably a safe bet we'll be able to squeeze out another one of these in October. I sure hope we do. Yeah, uh, hopefully. But until then, thanks for bearing with us. Yeah. And we will see you whenever we see you again. Yep. Bye bye. Bye.